The Valley of Bones. This is a new game box, part of the beautiful renaissance of the game book form that we are experiencing. The form was really big in the 1980s, fell apart in the 90s and in the early 2000s, and now it's back. And it's interesting because it's back mainly for the same people that used to read game box back then, for 40 year olds or around that age. And so actually now it is a mature form because the people that write them know that the audience is uh, has passionate adult is adult fans. Now, Value Bounds part of the Legendary Kingdom series. This is the first volume in that system, and it is based on the idea of a fantasy open world. You will get in this book to explore this area here, which is a single area of a larger world. This is the map of the entire world, and this is where we are located. You'll get to explore this area here with your party of fantasy heroes. Yes, you have four, which is a little bit unusual, and sometimes, uh, at least for me, prevents me a degree of, of identification. In most game books, you have a single protagonist, precisely because it's easier to relate. On the other hand, here, because you have multiple heroes, then actually some things that may happen have to do with the interactions among them. So your party of heroes will be going around and will be doing interesting things, but there isn't a single specific mission like you have, say, in the Lone Wolf game box or in the Fighting Fantasy game box. Uh, it's really about going out there and doing the things that you usually do in uh, in, in fantasy role-playing games. Uh, you slay monsters, you accept missions, you try to complete them, you visit weird dangerous areas, and you do so because of what? Because uh, you want money? Because you like to collect treasures and because you want to become stronger, more powerful, you want to acquire experience. It's because of self-aggrandizement. So you really have a book here that seems to come from uh, from a lot of experience as as a game master, as a dungeon master. The book seems to me to come from like notes that the author has accumulated from from decades of being a dungeon master. I mean that's 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 how the game the game book feels, which is a good thing, because you can see that there is uh, expertise, there is deep knowledge of the subject matter and the conventions of the subject matter. So we have an open world uh, game book in which you have your four heroes, they start with lower stats, they don't start with a lot of things. Uh, the beginning of the story is a little bit railroaded, but I'm talking about the first maybe 20 passages, there is a main thing, and then from there you just go wherever you want and you do different things. So on one hand it's exciting to have this sense of freedom, on the other hand of course that means that you decide when you want to stop. Maybe you're a completist, you want to see every paragraph of the book. That will take a lot of work, but I guess it's possible. I don't think it's a spoiler if I tell you that as you explore you will find different ways of getting to other areas of the world. Maybe you'll find a way to go across this chain of mountains here to explore this area. Maybe you'll find a way to navigate to another area. But of course those areas, well we don't have them yet, there's the first box, so we have to wait for other box, each depicting a different area. Also, speaking of how much uh, you can explore, which really is a main thing, if you're getting an open... Uh, an open world game book, well then you don't have the joy of seeing an overarching plot uh, starting, developing and coming to conclusion like you have in a lone wolf game book, but you have the joy of well roaming freely and just getting to experience the world. So you really need a lot of that world for that to be valuable. You need a lot of fictional content for you to experience and to discover and you really get that magical feel that you found the secret spot, that you discovered the secret area. And the book, Valor Bones, lets you do that, gives you that feeling of immersion of fantasy world and it does so also by, sh but among other reasons, among other ways, by sheer um, massive amount of content. Again, you need that. This book has 1903, 19, 903, 903 paragraphs. That's a lot. That's two fighting fantasy game books. It's almost three lone wolf game books. It's a lot, a lots of places to go. 
And again, the fact that the structure is such that you can go in a lot of different places as, op as opposed to other game books that have more of a timeline. So if you go in one direction, then these are the events, other events don't happen. Here, the structure is more space-based, so you can go really everywhere. So you really have a lot of paragraphs of sections that are non-mutually exclusive, and you can go and, and visit them. And I really have that, uh, that joy of immersing myself in a fantasy world, traveling from place to place, getting to a new place, getting to discover the city, finding, again, the joy, that moment uh, in which you discover something that seems not obvious and maybe a lot of other readers will miss. Then you have this sense of special connection. You travel around, and yes, again, the, the point, the beauty is the immersive freedom that you have. At the same time, there are also missions that you can complete. Some are what in a video game you call maybe side missions. They are simpler, and they give you some advantages, and then you have some overarching missions. You know of a big enemy somewhere that you don't have to go and defeat anytime soon, or ever, or ever. Or maybe even you may even decide to ally yourself with that with that uh, big enemy but that's uh, but that's completely up to you but if you decide to go for those big rewards that come with defeating mighty enemies then you know that there is work that you have to do and then you're building your characters from from mission to mission so you also have these overarching plots you have four fantasy heroes uh, to choose from from a group of heroes at the beginning so you can form your party of four so then usually most games uh, most game books you have a single hero that makes identification uh, easier for the reader here you don't really get to identify with one of them you're the sort of like strange uh, divine entity that guides them uh, this may be pedantic but of course the pros uh, uh, it's in second person, so it's you, which in English works because that works both for the singular and the plural. But basically, you have to work with imagination to figure out when they say you, what your heroes are, are doing. When, when they say like, I don't know, you are you, I don't know, you're sitting down. Am I imagining all four heroes sitting down exactly the same moment? You say that. Am I imagining all those heroes speaking in unison and saying those same words? No, you have to imagine which hero is doing something specifically while the other heroes are in the background, etc., etc., etc. It's interesting, though, that there are times in which the story zooms in and then the you specifically is one of the named characters that you have at the beginning. They're not generic characters. They come with biographical information. They come with a background. Maybe you go to the home town or one of them and there are things to be resolved there that have to do with that. Another interesting advantage that you have is the relationships that may emerge and they may form over time um, among these characters. It's an element, uh, maybe I missed some of the paragraphs, uh, but it's not a huge element it seems to me. Maybe in future books we can have more of that, but definitely it's an interesting potential that makes up for what you miss in terms of of identification. I haven't mentioned it yet, but if you are into game books, of course, uh, as I go talking about, uh, as I go on talking about game books, you may remember uh, Fable Lands, a classic game book, much revered among uh, among fans of this style of fiction, which was uh, in the 1990s the first open world game book series and was based on the same idea. Here you also had a shared world, each book depicted your adventures in one of these one of these areas and again basically some of the possible endings were connecting points in which you're told go to books such and such if you're traveling north enough to exit the map of this book then you're told go to book such and such paragraph 14 and then you will start from there and from there you can jump to any other book so it's a great precedent that actually does not reduce of course the value of this one firstly because it's not like open world game but oh it's such a big genre we had like 10 last year only enough is enough no it's not enough give us more i'm very excited if somebody is creating another one another series open world, do it just and just let me know i want i want more of that it's, it's incredibly fun it's great for those of us that love role-playing games 
but do not have the time to play them and so it's pretty much pretty much can work as a solitaire role-playing game but something i want to say about fable lands fable lands is awesome and this one i don't know if you figure it out is awesome too at least that's what i think i don't know if you figure it out that's how positively i think about this book i really liked it fable lands though had a problem uh although although Allegedly, you could go wherever you wanted. The book had been written a certain order, and you really had to solve them in a certain order because the monsters became increasingly, increasingly stronger from, and the challenges became harder and harder. So basically, if you started, if you jump from book number one to book number four, then you would be slaughtered. If you started from book number four, you were allowed to start with a stronger character. And then you go back to book number one and all the challenges would be very easy. This could have been solved easily, I believe, if you have a certain monster, instead of telling you the monster has this stat, instead of having just a number for the stat, you had a grid that told you, well, based on the level of your characters or uh, many books you had read, but based on the level, if you're level three, then the stat is such. If you're level four, then it's higher. If you're level five, that's higher. This way, the stats of the challenges would be aligned with the experience of the characters regardless of the order in which you read them. So if I'm level five, all the monsters that I encounter in the world are gonna be appropriate to that level, or the chance is gonna be appropriate to that level, regardless of where I am. I wonder how this is gonna be addressed in this series, because here I, don't, I see that, you know, again, every character, uh, every monster is a specific thing only. And of course, it's the first book, so we're gonna all start from here, we're gonna read the second book, but technically we shouldn't have to. We could wait until the entire series comes out and start from book five, and and then unless there is a way of, again, changing the stats, uh, again, in truth, the potential of the open world is at least partially squandered. So I wonder, I wonder how the author is gonna address that. So author, if you are watching this, let us know in the comments, I'd like to know that. One last thing I want to say, uh, it was a game book, so it's an interactive book with game elements. I like the game system here. I like the combat system and the skill system. It has to do with how many dice you roll. It has to do with, uh, with different elements that say they give you more options that you have in fighting fantasy. You always find fighting fantasy, which I love, a little limited from the point of view of combat, a little too repetitive. Here you have more options that you can do, more things, and you have an interesting spell system, which is very simple but it's effective enough to bring the combat system, um, to bring the magic element, gi to give you those tactical possibilities without becoming a burden. So what I want to say is from the point of view of gaming, the game mechanics, they also uh, work very well. They're smooth, they're intuitive, and yet they give you interesting choices. They go together well with a prose that is vivid, but is not quote unquote uh, self-indulgent. Again, these books, uh, I want them to be written in good English, but I don't want them to be too flourished. I want them to be terse and, and transparent so I can access the imaginary world through them. And they work very well. What I'm trying to say is that the prose stylistically works well, the fiction works well, the narrative tree gives you the possibility, or I should say the narrative firework maybe, gives you precisely the possibility of exploring the world. At all three main elements, that I want in a game book, which is the style of the prose, the net of connections, and the game mechanics, this game this game book works. It is definitely a solid product. It's a very promising beginning. I had a great time exploring this mysterious world. Uh, I lost a couple of times. Uh, I lost some heroes and then you get some more heroes and it's a world that you inhabit. So it's different from a lot of other game books but I can tell you. Definitely good. If you love game books I think you're gonna have a good time with this one. I call it the new Fable Lands maybe reductive but it may also be a good way of describing it. If follows that idea but then it turns into something very unique very personal and very very different with a lot of personality valley of bones i had fun reading exploring this book can't wait to see where the world goes next or where the story will bring me next